Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Hi, I'm Helen Minnis, and I'm going to talk about teacher parent co production to develop new educational models for the pandemic and beyond. Back at the beginning of the pandemic last March, um, we did qualitative interviews with more than 40 families and professionals in two waves, about a month after the first lockdown last March, and about two to three months after the first lockdown so towards the summer. Um, we were interested in finding out how families were coping with lockdown and in some ways the, the risk factors for families who were coping poorly were to be expected. So things like neurodevelopmental problems in children or parents, little indoor or outdoor space, um, but despite that many families were actually doing much better than expected. Who will struggle most can be actually quite tricky to identify because there's often a constellation which is unique to a particular family. So some colleagues of ours in England and their research did some similar um, qualitative interviews had a lovely example of uh, a young teenage mother um, living in a high rise who lost her job at the beginning of the pandemic. But she was loving lockdown because for the first time she had lots of time to have to do quality things with her little girl. And we came across wealthy two-parent families who had lost their childcare support and were really struggling. And what we saw were, was vicious and virtuous cycles across time. And for those families who seemed to enter a vicious cycle, parents were often struggling with homeschooling, families were usually lacking their, their normal childcare supports, contact with grandparents, nurseries, and um, parents were struggling to balance work commitments with childcare commitments, and children were lacking social contacts with friends. But what was interesting was that it was the way all of these different factors worked together for particular families um, and seemed to compound themselves or the opposite. So some families who were doing well at the beginning of the pandemic just seemed to be doing better and better and to adapt better and better. But the big dilemma was when to open and close schools and findings about that in the literature differ internationally. So um, there were studies in Ireland, Sweden and Japan that seemed to suggest school opening versus closure didn't make very little very much difference to infection rates. But in contrast, in Korea, the United States and France, evidence suggested that school closure, closure actually made a big difference to infection rates. And certainly um, when we were starting to do research on this, the literature was very equivocal and really didn't give you any good leads. But what we do know is that schools needed to develop support to avoid widening social inequalities and that school community communication has been crucial both during lockdown and also when planning for future lockdowns. So we developed an idea for something that we've called closed childcare clusters and this is the, the wonderful team that have, uh, have helped with that. So Apola, Geraldine and Evie who have been our research assistants Jess Enright, our disease modeler, and John Butcher, our educationalist. Um, so, to help me think about what a child, a closed childcare cluster is, let's imagine a local family who've been self-isolating under lockdown. And they go into a cluster with one other household. So for two to three days of the week, the child from the other household would join theirs and they would receive virtual support from teachers and 
materials for them to use with the children. And certainly in this latest lockdown, um, many schools have developed really fantastic resources and lots of support with live online lessons and things like that. And then for the other half of the week, the children would go over to their neighbours. Um, they would leave the house in the morning and come back in the afternoon. So the, the parents don't move, but the children do. So we've been engaging in a, a fantastic process of co-production with Scottish Borders Council. Um, we ran two waves of stakeholder focus groups um, with parents and teachers. Um, starting in, the, in spring last year and, and really we've been carrying this on since. And the aim has been to think with them about what would child closed childcare clusters look like in the Scottish borders and, and in the particular schools, the three schools that we've worked with. How might CCCs be adapted for families with particular needs or how might they be adapted for families to have larger clusters, maybe up, up to four or five families in a cluster? Which CCC designs, the specifics of designs are likely to be the safest in general, and also what will work best specifically in the Scottish border schools and in the particular schools. So we had schools that were fairly urban, others that were in rural areas, um, and we had uh, schools that were in quite materially deprived areas and wealthier areas, and they all differ. So in the first wave, we discussed how disease modelling works. So we just gave examples of the way that the diseases move in populations and who is likely to be infected and why. And then we gave group members a chance to try out disease modelling for themselves. And in the first wave, we had separate groups for teachers and parents. And that was partly because at the beginning of the pandemic, the relationships between teachers and parents were not good. There wasn't a lot of trust. And so we started with the group separately, but they essentially had the same discussions. And then in wave two, we repeated the process, but we brought the teachers and parents together. Um, and in between our disease modeler, Jess Enright, had gone away and taken um, some of the information from the first uh, stakeholder groups just to tweak the models um, with some of the specific information that had been given. Um, so to take into account the specific wishes and the balancing of risks made by the teachers and parents in Scottish borders. So just to give you a taster for the kinds of things that we discussed, this is a model of single family lockdown. Uh, the purple circles are children. The blue squares are parents, the green diamonds are grandparents, um, and in this model grandparents are not involved at all in childcare um, and families are isolating on their own. So this is a model where one child gets infected. So let's just see what happens over 29 days. And as you can see, this will be slightly different every time you run the model. So sometimes one parent will get infected and sometimes both, but essentially the, the infection is not going to extend beyond that particular family. But look what happens when everyone goes back to school and what you can see with all of the lines joining the purple dots, that's all of the, the different contacts each child has. And obviously as soon as you're in a classroom, Children have contacts, primary contacts with every child in the class, and their parents have secondary contacts with every child in the class. Again, grandparents are not involved. Let's see what happens when one child gets infected over 29 days. Very different picture there. So this is a depiction of closed childcare clusters, and in this particular scenario, we've chosen clusters of three families, different numbers of parents and groups. And again, one child gets infected. Let's see what happens over 29 days. So essentially, quite a few people in the children and parents in the cluster will get infected but nobody outside the cluster will get infected. 
So let's just look at these all together over 29 days. And clearly, to close childcare clusters are less safe in terms of infection risk than single family lockdown, but much, much safer than everyone going back to school. So that second phase of stakeholder focus groups was incredibly rich in terms of teachers and parents brainstorming how this could work in the area. And the groups came up with this model for the Scottish borders that we've called the Scottish model for safe education. And this would probably differ from area to area. So the borders families, they felt that most families in a lockdown situation, if they were allowed to use CCCs, would choose to be in CCCs. A few families said they would only cluster with extended family, for example, grandparents. And obviously grandparent clusters are riskier in the sense that older people are more likely to be severely affected or even die. Oh, hopefully now that people are being vaccinated, that might change a bit. And then a very few children would be in a local school hub. And of course, if only a few children go to a local school hub, then the school becomes a safer place because there are fewer contacts there. And within these groups, a few families still would have chosen to isolate at home, particularly people living in very rural areas. So just to put that slightly differently, um, the kind of funnel would be that closed childcare clusters would be the first and most preferred option. But if that wasn't available or wasn't appropriate, then the second favourite option would be a grandparent or trusted adult cluster, auntie or whatever. And then the local hub and teachers would facilitate conversations so continuing the co-production just to support families in choosing an option that could work best for them but on the whole the best option is that families work out their clusters for themselves so we've done a little bit of survey work in these schools just to find out what people think about clusters and interestingly when you survey people about half of families think that they, they would be interested in being in a cluster and have actually been able to think about who they would cluster with. Interestingly though, once you put people in stakeholder focus groups, often other families help the families who are less interested to think about ways that this could possibly work for them. So I suspect that with these survey findings, we'd have a, actually a shift towards more people preferring clusters once they actually start troubleshooting with teachers and parents and groups. The benefits of closed childcare clusters on the whole are seen as better, a better social experience for children, a better educational experience. But worries include concerns about the extra COVID risk compared to lockdown. And also some parents worrying about how they manage teaching other people's children. Interestingly, some of the teachers in the, in the child, closed childcare cluster suggested that they reckon that the peer pressure might actually make all of the children easier to teach than trying to, I mean, we all know what it's like trying to get our own children to do maths. It's not easy. But really what has come out of this for us is that that the actual process of teachers and parents getting together in small groups and troubleshooting and coming up with innovative solutions to help them think through the education of the children in their particular schools is very, very valuable. It seems to happen very quickly once the teachers and parents get together. And we were just amazed at the quality and sophistication of the ideas that they came up with. And so one of the things we've become quite excited about is that this could be a model for developing bespoke education plans, even beyond the pandemic. You know, those of us who work in mental health, we all know of children, you know, some children with weird mental problems who find the hustle bustle of a, of a classroom really very challenging. And getting teachers and parents together in groups might be really productive ways of thinking about innovative ways of supporting children beyond the traditional classroom. We'd be very interested in 
doing a live pilot of closed childcare clusters and borders and we're having discussions with government and with teachers and parents and borders about uh, whether this will be possible. But we've also been having discussions with educationalists in other parts of the world. So there are still parts of the world where schools are not open yet. And if, if possible, we would be very interested in conducting a live pilot, um, for example, in parts of the United States. So, you know, watch the space on that. And that's really all I want to say. And I'll very much look forward to your questions. Welcome back. So thanks a lot, Helen, for this talk. I think it was very clear, uh, very informative. I, I really appreciate the graph, which helped understanding, really. Uh, so um, we have a number of questions for you, Helen. So uh, we have the first question. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned schools having a responsibility to close inequality gaps. Do you have any evidence for how the childcare clusters won't perpetuate inequality further compared to school. Mm -hmm. And the, um, uh, the delegate keeps on noticing, I can imagine, for example, families choosing families who are like their own, which surely isn't very helpful for the children most in need. Such a good point. And this is something we've, we've thought about. I don't have an answer other than that, um, the, one of the things that came out in the first wave of focus groups was that families need to trust other families if they're going to educate their children together. But we didn't get a sense that it was only, you know, middle class families that were able to think about clustering together. And I think one of the things that was quite exciting was, for example, in one of our focus groups, we had two, we happened to have two parents who were essential workers. And they immediately said, well, we're going to be a bigger risk to other families, so we could cluster together. So it wasn't necessarily about that fam whether families were demographically similar. It was often a very pragmatic way of, um, of just thinking about, about risk. When it came to things like um, children with special educational needs, that was a big concern for families. And again, um, we had a woman in one of the focus groups who was saying nobody would be able to you know, help, you know, look after my child. But that was where the idea for the school hub came came up because they were actually trained classrooms, classroom assistants who could help her child. And I think, I, I think the key here is actually reaching all of the families. And one of the interesting things that happened is that we tried to survey the parents. We got a terrible response rate because the ethics committee had insisted that we had a very detailed initial sheet and actually what we found is that really engaging the the teachers to get a range of families of different different types of families different demographics together is a much more powerful way of making sure that you've that you're not just focusing on the kinds of parents who come to the you know who sit on the parent council but it's such an important point it's something that i think we would have to be very vigilant about Great, thanks, Helen. So uh, there are other questions, of course. Your, your talk was very interesting for a lot of delegates. So um, another question is uh, related to how practical is or was to implement countrywide this model? Yeah, so it's one of the things that's been very frustrating about this is that education tends to be extremely centralised. The Scottish government has been kept informed about this and has been really very supportive all along. But unfortunately, um, and I can completely understand where, where they sit on this, this would have to be something that was authorised at a whole government level. And if it was going to be piloted, it would need to be piloted um, in areas where the infection risk is, you know, there's... It wouldn't have been possible to pilot this, for example, at the time of the lockdown that happened just before Christmas in Scotland, because um, that we didn't have enough information about infection risk. So in order to implement this, there needs to be a constant conversation between the scientists, the teachers and parents in the area and the government. And that's what we've been doing in Scotland. So I'm actually meeting with 
um, a colleague, a public health colleague from the Scottish Government next week, just to update them. Um, so we haven't been able to try this in practice yet. Um, and, and I, you know, one of the things we're we're thinking about is is seeing whether there are other parts of the world where we could pilot this. But again, it's got to be part of the the government guidance, which makes this very difficult because. Uh, you know, the way things have happened so far in the pandemic, governments have had to make decisions really based on no evidence. So if anyone's got any brilliant solutions to that catch-22 conundrum, I'd be delighted to hear it. Yeah, yeah, it is. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, so another question now from Peter, who is a child psychiatrist. How do a CCS manage technology demand if several children are homeschooling together? Yeah, so I have been absolutely blown away by the work that the Scottish Borders have done on this. So, for example, in the last lockdown, all of us in the NHS as well, we were all trying to catch up with the technology. Now they've issued iPads to any child that doesn't have, um, you know, easy computer access. Um, they have three live um teaching sessions a day. So they have been extremely proactive in making sure that there aren't um, technological inequalities, basically. And again, I think this process of actually having teachers and parents in groups and brainstorming this has helped them to think about what's needed. So that's an important point. Yeah. So thanks, Helen. Um, Another interesting question, how do you think you will need, so do you think you will need to pilot it next winter? So that is the, the $6 million question. I mean, I'm speaking to colleagues from the government next next week. I don't think um, what came out of the, the focus groups in the last lockdown, it was clear that parents have a thirst to pilot this if the alternative is lockdown. If the alternative is school, then why would you want to do this? Unless you're um, a family where, for whatever reason, your child has problems being in school. So for me, I think the next interesting step would be to see whether this could be piloted if, for example, classrooms or schools are having to isolate. But that's a conversation that I need to have, um, or in areas where schools are not open yet in other countries. Mm. Thanks. Um, another question from Anne, uh, another child and adolescent psychiatrist and governor of special needs at school. How do you see that working in a PMLD school setting, so um, pupils with uh, deep, uh, profound learning needs? Yeah, so, I mean, it's been so interesting because the director, the ex-director of Education and Borders, um, who's now a consultant to Scottish Borders, John Butcher, he's actually been particularly interested in this kind of model for post-pandemic. Um, we haven't piloted it, you know, we haven't done the work with um, any kind of special needs establishments, but we think that the, the process of teacher-parent partnership could be, and you know, and the whole kind of stakeholder focus group methodology could be a really, a really excellent way of um, of helping this group. So, my I have more experience, as you said at the beginning, um, Samuel. Um, most of my experience has been with families where there's been abuse and neglect, with so with kinship care or foster care, and often groups of foster families, for example look after each other's children because no one else has the skills and also has the, the kind of governance arrangements in place to care for those children. So I could see great potential in that kind of environment for parents working with the school and, you know, getting together to try and think about bespoke educational solutions for these, for these children, whatever they would turn out to be. Yeah. That makes sense, Helen. So um, we have a delegate uh, from Switzerland. Uh, this is a really interesting talk, especially the models about the spread of the virus in the various models. I was wondering, what did you picture in the all kids back to school model as conditions of school, you know, regulations like before COVID? I guess how school is run uh, makes a big difference too. 
But the, the really frustrating thing is that we just don't know. The evidence is not there. Um, certainly, we've we've incorporated the latest disease UK wide disease modelling evidence into this. So, you know, it's modelled the 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 models incorporate what we know currently about the infection rate in children and the infection rate in adults. And one of the things that we have been able to do, for example, is to look at things like what would happen if you had to close childcare clusters, but the parents break the rules. Um, but one of the difficult things is that, um, that, that, that I'm, I'm just, it's just an incredible research gap. There's been very, very little um, research about what actually happens in schools. Um, so what we've based most of our models on is contacts. So what we can't what we can be confident about is, you know, if you're in a classroom of 25 children for a whole day, then yes, you are in contact with all of those of those children. But I don't think anyone has information that's any more sophisticated than that about what would happen, for example, if children actually maintain social distancing or if you have um, half the number of children that we're, we're kind of guessing, unfortunately. And I mean, we are all guessing internationally. Um, the, it, I've just been amazed at how, uh, how little we know about the details of that. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think uh, evidence is uh, accumulating, is increasing, but still is, is not enough really to, to inform um, policies, guidance. Uh, right, so we go ahead because we have other interesting questions. So, um, would you see benefits of this uh, unrelated to pandemic, more flexibility for children with ASD, ADHD, and so on and so forth, who may be anxious or school avoidance? Uh, this is from Susan, who is an educational psychologist. Yes, so my colleague John Butcher used to be the head of additional support for learning in Glasgow. And this is what really excites him about that because, you know, so we've actually been doing workshops with teachers about supporting um, children with neurodevelopmental problems during COVID. And what we're hearing from parents is that, you know, as we know, no two children with autism are the same. So some children with autism really benefit from the structure of being in a classroom. Other children with autism who have um, sensory sensitivities might find it absolutely overwhelming. And I think that's true for children with ADHD as well. And so in a sense for me, yes, I'm excited about the closed childcare cl cluster model, but I'm actually even more excited about the model of getting parents and teachers and groups together just to brainstorm this. Because our workshops have really shown that it's been very, very helpful to talk to teachers about just how different children's needs are and to then think specifically in a way that generally teachers don't get an opportunity to do. So yes, I think I think that I think if there's anything that could come out of this post pandemic, it would be that. Good. Um, so we have actually another question from Maurice, who is a child adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry if I miss you uh, mentioned the age of the children, but given that there seems to be less risk of infection and transmission in younger children and more in older teenagers, should there be different models for the different age groups? Definitely. Such a good point. I'm glad you asked it because we did our modelling with primary school children because at the time of the lockdown, it was parents of children at primary school age or younger that were really struggling because, you know, many of those parents had lost their childcare supports. They were often trying to work and offer childcare. So they were the parents that seemed to us to have an impossible task. However, teenagers, we know from the disease modelling, are actually more likely more likely to break the rules. And I don't want to say that disrespectfully because many teenagers have really, really maintained the rules. So as, but as a group, um, obviously, you know, you have, you're not going to be supervising your teenagers quite as much. And so there's, and then also we think infection rates are greater. But that's again, the power of the co-production. So if you were going to develop childcare clusters for secondary school, then the, the form of those would come out of the discussion, if that makes sense. So absolutely, and that's, you know, 
you'd want different um, models for rural schools and urban schools. You might want different models for schools where there are families, where there are lots of families who are living with in, in bigger extended families. And the exciting thing about this is we, we actually don't know what the answers will be. But the point is that the teachers and the parents will come up with the answers with the disease modelling information so that if they've got the risk information, they can bal balance the risk and they can come up with the solutions. I see. That makes sense, yeah. Good. Um, so another question is, uh, with the return to school, uh, has the spread of infection followed your model? Sorry, say that. Sure. Uh, with the return to school, has the spread of infection followed your model? Has, do you think that it has been consistent with your model? Yeah, so it, it's, yes, I mean, I think, so there's, there's nothing that's happened with the two school returns. So we started mod doing our disease modelling in last spring. And so there's been a there's been a school return in the summer, and then again, obviously now, and there's there's nothing that's happened that's contradicted our models. Basically, um, you know, that certainly in the summer there was a you know there was a, a spike of infection, which is what you would have expected, with just many many more contacts. So I think, absolutely, and I, and I think I, I personally think that. You know, the school, certainly in Scotland, I think the school return has been handled very sensibly this time um, because it has, it ha you know, the, the government has actually waited until the infection rates were really quite low, until the vaccination rates have gone up. But, um, but I, I really, I, I've, I, think, I think governments have had to make impossible decisions because there's been so little knowledge. Yeah. Sure. sure. So um, we have another couple of messages. Actually, they are not questions, but more feedback. But it's always good to hear positive feedback. So I'm going to read this. Not negative, if there's any negative. <laughs> <laughs> so far, no negative. So um, not a question. Just want to say I'm so glad we are thinking about how we can uh, take these lessons forward after the pandemic for children who don't get on well in traditional school setting. And I think this is in line with what we were discussing yesterday really uh, about uh, opportunities and ways of thinking new models. So um, this is, I think, clearly a feedback we share. And uh, thanks indeed, Ellen, brilliant talk. This is uh, from Catherine who comments, uh, such a fascinating time. So um, we have actually still time. We have 10 minutes, actually. You have been very good in uh, limiting your talk to, to provide more space for, for the discussion. So. Um, while I'm looking forward to receiving other uh, questions, I was just wondering, Helen, uh, I was really interested in, in terms of the differences across countries that you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your talk, um, how uh, the impact of uh, school closing has been different across countries, uh, France, Italy and the other countries. So do we have any insight about this, um, about possible explanations for this? It's po so it's possible that there have been more recent insights that I'm I'm not aware of. So I'm not I'm not going to claim to 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 know if I could have missed something. But I found it really hard um, when looking at the literature to to understand why certain countries seem to have different responses to school return or to school re um, to school closure. There was some suggestions, and I think this was from a study that had happened in France that the timing in the course of the pandemic is really important. So, but, but there's so little information, it's very hard to be, to be specific. I certainly heard anecdotally that um, there seem to be differences according to culture. So, and, and, and in some ways I, I, I'm really giving kind of personal anecdote here because my husband's American, I live in Scotland and my daughter actually has spent half of the pandemic in Taiwan, where they dealt with, you know, they dealt extremely well with COVID and they basically got rid of it. So she's been living the life of a normal 24 year old. And anecdotally, I do hear that certain cultures, individuals in certain cultures are more like, more or less likely to break the rules. You know, we say in Britain, an Englishman's home is his castle. Um, you know, compared to some other cultures, I think, um, 
Because I, I think that's bound to have a factor, to, to, to be a factor. But it's frustrating because um, there just hasn't been time. There hasn't been time for any, you know, any trials, obviously. So I'm speculating. I see. So, Helen, uh, you have other positive feedback, um, and uh, I'm afraid no negative feedback so far, Helen. Uh, so, um, I was wondering, you know, you, you have built, uh, you are building uh, a model which has enormous potential, and uh, looking ahead, uh, let's imagine, let's pretend you have unlimited funding for your research, which, of course, is not possible. Uh, but uh, how would you like to develop this? And also, I was thinking, um, looking at more the international dimension, um, do you plan to liaise with international colleagues? Are you aware of other similar initiatives out there? I'm not aware of other similar initiatives. So a few months ago, we liaised with colleagues in Ohio. Um, so, and interestingly, they were just at a stage where you know, the governor was saying one thing and different directions of education were saying it. And, and I was just checking on the web and it sounds as if there's still quite a bit of controversy there. Plan to get back in touch with them because I think this could be piloted anywhere. Mm -hmm. And certainly, so we're funded, actually I should have put funding on it. We were funded by a Winston Churchill Memorial Trust grant, very small, but, but very useful. And what we told them is that we will produce a manual for the co-production. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, how do you do it? because it could be done anywhere. If I had unlimited funds, I would do a cluster randomised controlled trial and we applied for that um, back in April and we weren't successful. I think part of the reason is that, is this health? Is it education? Is it economics? Because for me, there would have been enormous economic potential for this at the height of the pandemic because, you know, if you had a cluster with five families, four of the families would have been able to, to basically work without childcare responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of the things I've just found amazing is that there just doesn't have to seem to have been an acknowledgement that many parents across the world have literally been simultaneously doing two jobs. Mm -hmm. So I initially got interested in this because of parental stress, um, concerns about parental stress, and we know that higher parental stress is linked to the higher risk of child abuse. Mm -hmm. So our outcome measures, our primary outcome measure would have been parental stress, actually. But we also were really interested to look at the health economics. So I just think a really a nice, robust, cluster randomised controlled trial of the health economic input would be great if anyone wants to give us a few million. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> right. So actually, in relation to this, there is an observation from a colleague, a child psychologist from Switzerland, uh, where schools were never really closed and families organized their uh, CCCs on their own. Interesting. Uh, yeah. That doesn't surprise me. So they'd started doing that in Scotland and then it suddenly became against the law. Maybe we should talk. If you, whoever you are, email me because I would be so interested in any data that we can gather. I mean, although surveying is not the way to ask this question of, of parents because you're going to get a skewed um, response. We have, we have been able to show from our survey work that families, some families, but more than half of families actually, can actually think of who they would cluster with. So this is not an impossible thing for families to think of. And the other families probably are going to need a bit more support. But if you if the school and the community are only having to to kind of support a, a minority of families, then obviously we have more resources to do that. Mm -hmm. um, also, in relation to what you mentioned in the previous answer, um, one of the delegate wonders how uh, your manual will be available. The manual. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, so we. I mean, we could make it available and, you know, it'll be it'll be a, a report for the Winston Churchill Trust, but certainly we'll, you know, we'll um, advertise it as much as we can. We'll, we'll tweet about it and uh, maybe we can tell ACAM about it. <laughs> yes, we would be delighted to support uh, this. We've been so busy thinking about um, how to actually get the model piloted, but it's a very good question. We need to, because it'll be, you know, just in the next couple of yeah. months, we'll be starting to produce that. Good. 
So I guess we have still time for another couple of questions. So um, great talk. I just wondered if there were any safeguarding concerns. Uh, Good question. Yeah, so the way, and in some ways I think this links to the very first question about making sure that you don't increase inequalities. Trust between families is the, is the key. And essentially, if you think about that funnel, that most of the families seem to feel that they could organise this. So it's, it's you know, you... We, we don't get police checks on people that we do play date that we arrange for our, friend, our children to go for play dates with. So there has to be some degree of, of trust in the community. But certainly, we, we have been thinking carefully with the schools about what do you do about families where, you know, the fact the teachers are thinking, not sure you'd want that family to be clustering. So we need to find a non-stigmatising way of encouraging those families and others, for example, who have children with special needs, um, to basically to, to, to be supported. Yeah. Um, yeah. Important. So, Helen, another question, once again, I, I'm not sure there is a, a strong evidence to support this. So, uh, is there any a sex difference in terms of ease of homeschooling and child demands needs? <laughs> I laugh because I am not aware of any evidence. All I can say is that when my children were small, there was a there was a saying in Scotland. It wasn't very long lasting, and it was the the smog, and it was the smug mother of girls. And certainly, I have a girl and a boy, and everyone everyone says that boys are harder to look after. But I'm not going to comment because um, that might actually not have any empirical basis. So I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I think once again, this is one of those um, aspects that really for which we need more empirical data. Exactly. So, exactly. What I would say, though, is that I, I'm, I'm joking about that, but I do think it's a fundamental principle that not all parents have the same parenting task. There's no doubt, you know, we know if you have a child with ADHD, your parenting task is a more stressful one. And it's important to acknowledge that if we're thinking about how to support parents in the pandemic, full stop. Sure. Good. So, great. Thanks a lot, Helen. Uh, I think there were a couple of more questions, but unfortunately, we need to move on. But I'm sure uh, our delegates can get in touch with you and to uh, to discuss further about this model, which I think was really that is a very important and uh, innovative model. So, thanks a lot, uh, Helen, for your contribution. We look forward to seeing the developments of this. Thanks. Thank you. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.